You map. It takes a big pile of data that you can't graph and helps you graph it. Hooray! StatQuest. Hello, I'm Josh Starmer and welcome to StatQuest. Today we're going to talk about UMAP Dimension Reduction Main Ideas. This StatQuest is sponsored by Lightning and Grid.ai. With Lightning, you can design, build, and scale models with ease. Focus on the business and research problems that matter to you. Lightning takes care of everything else. And with Grid, you can use the cloud to seamlessly train hundreds of models from your laptop with a single command. No code changes necessary. For more details, follow the links in the pinned comment below. Note, this stack quest focuses on the main ideas of how UMAP works. However, if you are also interested in the mathematical details, be sure to check out the follow-up quest, UMAP Mathematical Details. Now, imagine we collected weight and height measurements from a bunch of people. And we plotted the people on a two-dimensional graph like this, where we have weight on the x-axis, the first dimension, and height on the y-axis, the second dimension. Seeing the data can be useful to identify outliers and to identify clusters of similar people. So, looking at data can be very useful and, generally speaking, is one of the first steps in any data analysis. However, if we wanted to include each person's age, we would have to add a third axis. And now our graph is three-dimensional. Drawing a three-dimensional graph on a two-dimensional computer screen is awkward, but possible. However, if we wanted to include a lot more features, we'd need to draw a four- or more-dimensional graph, and that's not possible. So, what do we do if we have a lot of features and we want to look at the data? Well, one good option is Principal Component Analysis, PCA. And if you're not already familiar with PCA, you definitely should be, so check out the quest. Anyway, the problem with PCA is that it only works well when the first two principal components account for most of the variation in the data. Simply put, if you have a really complicated data set, PCA may not work very well. So, if we can't use PCA, what should we do? One option is called UMAP. Uniform, Uniform manifold, manifold, approximation, approximation and, projection. and projection. UMAP takes high-dimensional data, meaning data with three or more features, and outputs a low-dimensional graph, meaning a graph we can easily look at. UMAP is popular because it is relatively fast, even with large data sets. And similar samples tend to cluster together in the final output, so it is useful for identifying similarities and outliers. Bam. So we can see what UMAP does and how it works. We're going to start with a very simple two-dimensional graph and show how UMAP converts it to a one-dimensional number line. In other words, this two-dimensional graph will represent the high-dimensional data that we reduce with UMAP to a single dimension that will be the low-dimensional graph. If we look at the high-dimensional data, we see that points A, B, and C are relatively close to each other and form a cluster. And points D, E, and F are relatively close to each other and form another cluster. And both clusters are relatively far from each other. The goal of UMAP is to create a low-dimensional graph of this data that preserves these high-dimensional clusters and their relationship to each other. The general idea is to initialize the low-dimensional points and then move the low-dimensional points around until they form clusters that have the same relationships we saw in the high-dimensional data. In other words, because points A, B, and C are clustered together and are relatively far from the other cluster, UMAP wants the low-dimensional points A, B, and C to be close to each other and relatively far from the other cluster. So let's talk about the main ideas of how UMAP makes this happen. Note, if UMAP simply projected all of the data onto the x-axis, then, instead of two distinct clusters, we'd see a mishmash of points. 
And if we had a slightly more complex data set with a third cluster here, then projecting the data onto the y-axis wouldn't be any better. So, what UMAP does is calculate similarity scores to help identify clustered points so it can try to preserve that clustering in the low-dimensional graph. The first thing that UMAP does is calculate the distances between each pair of high-dimensional points. Note, I'm only showing two of the distances between the two clusters, but just know that we calculated all of them and that the clusters are way far apart. Now, to calculate the similarity scores associated with point A, we start by putting point A on a graph. Now, because point A is 0.5 units away from point B, we put B 0.5 units away from A on the graph. And because point A is 2.4 units away from C, we put C 2.4 units away from A on the graph. And because the remaining points D, E, and F are all way far away from A, we put them way far away from A on the graph. Now we draw a curve over the data to calculate the similarity scores. The shape of this curve depends on the number of high-dimensional neighbors that you want each point to have. A common default value for the number of high-dimensional neighbors is 15, but in this example, where we have a tiny data set and we know each cluster has three points, we'll set it to three. Note, to be clear, the number of neighbors we want each point to have includes the point itself. So, by setting the number of neighbors to three, we actually only want two other points as neighbors. Also, later in the quest, we'll talk about what happens when we change the number of neighbors we want each point to have. But for now, let's just set the value to three. Now brace yourselves, things are about to get a little mathy. The purpose of this math is to get an understanding of how the number of nearest neighbors parameter, which is arguably the most important UMAP parameter you can adjust, works. So, that said, UMAP takes the log base 2 of the number of high dimensional neighbors you want each point to have. And since we set the number of high dimensional neighbors to 3, we get the log base 2 of 3, which equals 1.6. And this value, 1.6, is what defines the shape of this curve. The curve is shaped in such a way that the y-axis coordinates for the nearest neighbors, which in this case are points B and C, add up to the log base 2 of the number of nearest neighbors you specified, which in this case is 1.6. In other words, this curve is shaped the way it is so that the y-axis coordinate for B is 1.0, and the y-axis coordinate for C is 0.6, and the y-axis coordinates for D, E, and F are all pretty much zero. Adding these scores together gives us 1.6, the target number we are shooting for. Thus, the y-axis coordinates for points B and C are their similarity scores relative to A. And since the scores for D, E, and F are all zero, we can ignore them for now. So let's save the similarity scores for B and C. Bam! Now, just like we did for point A, let's calculate the similarity scores relative to point B. First we put point B on a graph, and then we add all the other data at their respective distances. And then we draw a curve over the data so that the sum of the similarity scores, the y-axis coordinates for each point other than B, equals 1.6. Anyway, just like before, because points D, E, and F are way far away, their scores are zero and we can ignore them. So we only need to save scores for A and C relative to B. Likewise, we calculate and save the non-zero scores for point C. Bam. Note. You may have noticed that the similarity score for C relative to B, 0.6, is different from the similarity score for B relative to C, 1.0. The difference comes from the fact that the curves for each point are different. UMAP scales the curve so that, regardless of how close or far the neighboring points are, 
the sum of the similarity scores will be equal to the log base 2 of the number of nearest neighbors that you specify. And scaling the curves ensures that every point is similar to at least one other point in the dataset. However, using different curves mean the similarity scores are not symmetrical. So UMAP makes them symmetrical using a method similar to taking the average, and this is one of those details we'll discuss in the follow-up stat quest. Bam. Note, in the exact same way, UMAP calculates the similarity scores for points D, E, and F. Bam! Now UMAP initializes a low-dimensional graph. But, as we can see, this low-dimensional graph is not ideal because point B needs to be closer to A because they are in the same high-dimensional cluster and point B needs to be further from F because they are in two different high-dimensional clusters. So, to make this low-dimensional graph show the same clusters we see in the high-dimensional data, UMAP picks two low-dimensional points that it should move closer together. UMAP does this by randomly selecting a pair of points in a cluster proportionally to their high-dimensional score. In this case, that means there is a higher probability that UMAP might randomly select points A and B because their score is 1.0. And there is a lower probability that UMAP might randomly select points A and C because their score is 0.8. So, for this example, let's assume that UMAP randomly selected points A and B. And that means UMAP wants to move points A and B closer together. Then UMAP flips a coin and decides to move point B closer to A. Note, it could have just as easily decided to move point A closer to B. Now that we know that we will move point B closer to A, UMAP picks a point that B should move further from. So UMAP randomly picks one of the points that are not in B's high dimensional cluster. However, unlike before, this time the high-dimensional scores do not influence which point is picked. Instead, each point in a different cluster, regardless of its score, has an equal chance of being picked. So, let's imagine UMAP picked point E. Now that UMAP has decided to move point B closer to A, because they should be clustered together, and move point B further from E, because they should be in different clusters, UMAP has to figure out how much it should move point B. To do this, UMAP calculates low-dimensional similarity scores, y-axis coordinates on a curve, for points B and A, and for B and E. However, now, instead of using a variety of curves like we did for the high-dimensional data, the low-dimensional similarity scores come from a fixed bell-shaped curve that is derived from a t-distribution. Note, generally speaking, a t-distribution curve is like a Gaussian curve or normal distribution, except the t-distribution tends to be shorter and have fatter tails. Also note, the low-dimensional curves are all the same size. Now, because points A and B are in the same cluster or neighborhood, UMAP wants to move point B closer to A in order to maximize this low-dimensional score. In contrast, because points B and E are in different clusters, UMAP wants to move point B further from E so that it can minimize this low-dimensional score. So, ultimately, UMAP moves point B a little closer to A and a little further from E. Note, UMAP only moved point B a small amount because, when there is a ton of data, taking small steps each turn makes it easier to get the low-dimensional graph looking just right. Double BAM! Now UMAP picks another pair of points to move together. In this case, UMAP wants to move D closer to E. Then UMAP randomly picks a point in the other cluster to move D away from. In this case, UMAP decides to move D away from C. Now UMAP calculates low-dimensional similarity scores to decide how to move point D. Note, 
If we move D closer to E, the point we want to get closer to, then we will also be moving D closer to C, the point we want to get further from. However, this move barely increases the score for D relative to C. In other words, the score we want to minimize will still be pretty small. In contrast, the score we want to maximize, the score relative to E, will get much larger. Thus, UMAP moves D a little closer to E. Likewise, UMAP moves the points one step at a time until we have two low-dimensional clusters that are relatively far from each other just like we see in the high-dimensional data. Triple BAM! Note, if you're familiar with how T-SNE works, you may have noticed that UMAP is very, very similar. In terms of the main ideas of how UMAP and T-SNE work, they are essentially the same, and most of the differences are very subtle. However, there are two big important differences. The first difference is that T-SNE always starts with a random initialization of the low-dimensional graph. In other words, T-SNE might start out with the low-dimensional data looking like this, and then, the next time you run T-SNE on the exact same data set, it might start out with the low-dimensional data looking like this. And every time you run T-SNE on the same data set, you start with a different low-dimensional graph of the data. In contrast, UMAP uses something called spectral embedding to initialize the low-dimensional graph. And what that means is that every time you use UMAP on a specific data set, you always start with the exact same low-dimensional graph. Bam! The other difference is that T-SNE moves every single point a little bit each iteration. In contrast, UMAP can move just one point, or a small subset of points, each time, and this helps it scale well with super big datasets. BAM! Lastly, way back when we calculated similarity scores for the high dimensional data, we said that the shape of each curve was determined in part by the user defined parameter the number of neighbors each point has. Now let's talk about what happens when we change the number of neighbors. Generally speaking, when you have a lot of data, a relatively low value for the number of neighbors results in small, independent clusters. In some ways, this is sort of like seeing the details, but not the big picture. In contrast, a relatively large value for the number of neighbors gives you more of the big picture and less of the details. So it can be worth trying different values to see what works best with your own data. BAM! Now it's time for some. Shameless self-promotion. If you want to review statistics and machine learning offline, check out the StatQuest study guides at statquest.org. There's something for everyone. Hooray! We've made it to the end of another exciting StatQuest. If you like this StatQuest and want to see more, please subscribe. And if you want to support StatQuest, consider contributing to my Patreon campaign, becoming a channel member, buying one or two of my original songs, or a t-shirt, or a hoodie, or just donate. The links are in the description below. Alright, until next time, quest on!